What's up, guys? The Carrot Poker Podcast is back. And by that, I mean I made two in a row. That's kind of a rarity for me. So very proud of myself right now. This is episode 86, catching up with the backgammon guy, who is now a bit of a bit more of a poker guy. Is that right, two of you? What would you say? Uh, I would say absolutely. Poker is by far taking the lead. Uh, I don't really play backgammon at all much. I might get back into it, but poker is my game. Period. Cool. So an episode something or other, maybe I'm going to guess here and say like 50 something, I have no idea. We caught up with you before and you were sort of touring the country, playing a lot of backgammon, high stakes, adrenaline rushes. You were just getting into poker for the first time. That was probably a couple of years back, probably like 2018, 17. Two years ago to the day, basically. Seriously? I was on your podcast. Yes, April 26th. Wow. 2018. Okay. So it's been two years. Yeah. Nice. It's crazy. So what's been what's been up then? You so backgammon took a backseat, and you've been playing mostly live over in Vegas then. Uh yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks, Doctor Clark, for having me on the show. Of course. Um, and so uh, just to just to fill up. So when I was on your podcast, I had been playing poker for one year only, but very intensely and in, in studying. And you know, if you remember, I was kind of at a turning point. You know, where things were starting to, you know, I had a rough year. I was losing for most of that year. You know, my mental game was weak, etc. But, you know, at you know after a year, things I started to get on the right path. Okay, and then you know I hung up with you and I said, holy shit, I just talked a humongous game. Well, now I really got to back back this shit up. So, what I did for the next 12 months straight, we're talking every day between six and eight hours a day, sometimes more, never less, of nonstop pio work. That's wow. it. And and Solsky. And Solsky uh, and some other run at once coaches. Mm-hmm. But ev- nonstop. I did not play at all, basically. It was like 98% study, no playing. And that wasn't even my intention. It was just going so well from the start. Okay, and I loved it. I really loved and still do working with Pio. It's it's just a wonderful game. It's like studying a language. It's like it's just studying. It's good study. And I just ran script after script, spot after spot, run out after run out, day in, day out, until I got sick of it. Okay? And it was about 12 months of that. And then I said, okay, I got burnt out. I couldn't do any more. But I said, okay, now you're probably ready to go. Okay, so last year, I decided, okay, I'm going to start with 2-5, and I wanted to pick a game that was not necessarily the easiest game, but the game where I would learn the most and and grow the most. So what I did is I went to the Red Rock Casino in Summerlin, and it's a one, it's only, it runs every day, uh, I don't know if it still runs, but it, it was running every day when I went, and it's a lot of the same people. Okay, it's not the easiest 2-5 in town, but you know, it's not bad, but it's the same people over and over again. You know, it was about, I'd say about 15 of us total rotating, and the occasional, you know, rando here and there, but um, so what happened was I got, I, I played every day, I'd say, I'd say about six to eight hour sessions, and then I would go home and go back to Pio as well, uh, every day. And this was my life for three months, and very quickly, live poker became an immense joy. It became like meditation, and I, my, I was stoic. I was playing my A game constantly, um, also because it was new, you know, I hadn't played much, but I was so proud of myself, and I was crushing, okay? It wasn't just that I was getting lucky, which I probably did as well, but I could just see the mistakes like I was looking at him in Pio, I could see the EV, I'd go home and check my plays. I was playing really good at 2-5, and I was winning the game, okay? I don't know exactly how much, but I was slaughtering, okay? And I did, and so for the year in Pio, all I did was study GTO. My intention was to get into node locking. I never made it because I never finished the GTO. However, when I got to this game, I ran into certain players that was so obviously exploitable that it just happened naturally. And I started to do some node locking as well. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, so just for example, I had, there was one guy we played with. It's very, he, for, he was at nine, he was like 85. He would fall asleep at the table often when he was there every day. He never bluffed one time. 
if he had a strong hand, he'd bet. If he had a medium hand or a strong jar, he would call. And if he didn't, he would fold without exception. Okay? He never bluffed one time. So it would be insane for me to play GTO. So I went, did a lot of good node blocking work. I didn't need much. And I noticed something very critical that people are really exploiting poorly. And that's why they're not moving up. They are, they are completely, they're not doing node locking. They're not exploiting properly. Their reads, their population reads, they're going so far off the chart. So I was beating the regs, crushing the regs. Some of these regs that many people know through videos, I could see how bad they were. I could see their mistakes. I could go check in Pio. You know, I became a whiz at Pio. I know how to check things perfectly. I have, you know, I, I, and I use Pio, I use Munker for preflop, which probably wasn't necessary, but I had it anyway. So I had GTO preflop. I could change it if I wanted to, but I usually didn't have to. And it was just so clear to me why these people were stuck at 2 5. Yeah. Okay. I think this Does kind of illustrates, sense? yeah, absolutely. I think this illustrates like why the way I coach is always like, like I used to coach really exploitatively before the Pio days, right? Like before the solver, mm -hmm. my coaching right, was right, like. Right do this do that this beats people but it wasn't really it didn't have a baseline and it was just like kind of picking a random set of coordinates on the map and then making a ton of random assumptions and then like going off from there and some of it was right and other parts were just like what i'd call like lazy bad ingrained habits like just like right. things that sound like truths to, to yourself but they're not actually and then when i got pio it was all like gto 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 like oh my god this is the future in poker my game felt right. as shit like when I first learned GTO, my game was terrible in like 2013, right, right. 2014, because I couldn't do it. And I didn't understand the reason for it. Everyone's game was terrible back then, though, you know. So it and it, yeah, and everyone's game was terrible when they first learned to work with the solver, I think, as well, before right, they really right. like calibrated that. Right, um, so right. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Like if you started off as someone with a very little, with a very limited set of beliefs about poker, which is a blank slate, which is a fantastic place to start, and you learn the game theory of poker first, but with an open mind to exploitative play, that is the nuts. Like I can see why you've had a lot of success it's live. The it's the best the way to go. Because it's like, <laughs> this is when you okay. start with a, a student that's, um, there's two types of students that are impossible to teach. One is the guy that is so obsessed with Pio that he just doesn't understand humans. Like he has no idea how right. to understand how humans think. That was that you was in, the in the beginning. I remember that. Sure. Yep. Right. And then on the other end of the spectrum, right, you have the guy that's, like so exploitative but not in a good way he just has all these old mantras and semi-truths right, that he says right. to himself like right. oh you gotta bet there with a the flush draw it's like well right. why do we have to bet right. there with the flush right. draw you know um right. so i think the way you've gone about it makes a lot of sense and i love by the way coming home to payo like people say coming home to the wife and kids after a long day at the office or in the grind oh, yeah. coming home to yeah. payo you know no it was relaxing because it because i you know i mean i wasn't right every time of course but i was right so i was right a lot and it just gave me that confidence so you know after three months my confidence was through the roof as it should be i put in the work and remember i came into poker late so i had like you said a clean slate and the best tools ever available yeah okay because i had coaches on run of ones that had been doing the solver work and they're now good at it and these are the top pros so sauce is a god okay sauce was huge for my game he's also good working with pio but i also you know my own it was a com mostly my own but sauce was good but long story but anyway so so the three months went by and i said okay you are and again i i'm I, you know me i'm a humble guy right i i know i'm a realistic mathematical guy but i couldn't deny the fact that i was slaughtering the two five regs they were so bad they they were they were making so many mistakes it was disgusting, like just easy mistakes. So I realized I'm I, I'm a two five end boss already, mm -hmm. which is the truth. I can sit down at any two five table in Vegas and slaughter, okay. But this is where it gets even more interesting. What I realized also during this time was the power of table selection. The app now two five I didn't table select. I didn't need to, but there is a there is five ten in Vegas, and I'm telling you. Oftentimes the 510 is juicier than the 25. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I went so I I lived on the strip, okay? Um for you know, I was at the Veer Towers for most of this also. Um recently I moved out to Summerlin, um but I was playing at Aria when Aria and when 
nonstop and I knew all the regs and you know I knew I knew there were there were I'd say a few also strong two five regs but but they they were set in some ways as well so, mm. but I knew everybody and the but more importantly I knew the five ten strong players okay now I'm not a five ten end boss however there are certain times of the day where it's just you and the tourists okay uh, I used to go at 10 a.m. That was my time, and and the strong players would come, you know, between four and six, and I would leave. Mm -hmm. Right, my day was over. I was literally playing with one three style players for big money, and the money was coming in hand over fist. Okay, because also there's the rake was less of a factor. I didn't mm -hmm. worry about the rake. I could play more hands. I could see more flops. So I became very comfortable post flop, of course, and I looked for excuses to get involved. Right, there were certain hands I would play pre-flop that might have been not optimal so to speak but I knew I had an edge post flop so especially in certain table dynamics as well so I so I became very so you know I'm always watching the table dynamics who everyone at the table how far they are on my left how far they are on my right I have no shame switching seats I did it constantly and it's critical to to have that understanding so I would always be in the most profitable seat and play the most profitable strategy towards the table, okay? Not that there were big shifts in that strategy, but you know, if just a simple explanation, if the big blind was tight, then I would open wider, yep. you know, just simple. I wouldn't go crazy with the exploits. And if the guy never bluffs, then, you know, there were certain hands I, I couldn't get away from, like, you know, because you just, it's too far away from GTO, but basically, you know, the obvious strong exploitative spots was worth my attention and then GTO was took over. So I started to slaughter 510, okay? Only because I table selected heavy. Now, when the I did play it with the good players as well, um, you know, for practice mostly, mm. but it's a, it's it, the game changes. Like so, you know, by 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 midnight you've got 3 strong ass players at mm -hmm. your table versus 0. And I did play 2550 a couple times just to check it out. I cannot explain to you how massively different you can't even imagine the difference in skill level between 510 and 2550. I, I probably will never break close to 25. It's insane. It's like a chess level from 1800 to 2400, something ridiculous. Right, okay. 2550 is a beast that, you know, I, I never even intended. I actually, I was shooting for it, and I kind of still am, but I've accepted the reality that I probably will never get to 2550. So what do you think is, so, um, so you've described yourself as being extremely fluent in Pio now, the exploits are coming naturally, you're able to deviate from that. It sounds like you have the full toolkit um, for any poker game. So what is it that these 2550 bosses have that you currently don't have in your game? Okay, I'll tell you, that's a great question and the answer is very simple. So, um, you know, as you know, you can simplify your strategy and barely give away any EV in many, many spots, if not yeah. most, mm -hmm. right? That, that's a common thing. When you get to 2550, you are going to see plays that you've never even imagined. And you're gonna see bets that you never imagined. You're gonna see sizes you never imagined. You're gonna see leads you never, you're gonna, they're gonna, what they do is they try and get you out of your comfort zone. They mm -hmm. know the complete strategy, okay? They know the complete strategy. It's beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not gonna name names. I'm not really a name namer, but these are guys that you know. These are guys that play 10Ks on the regular. Mm -hmm. um, these are the crushers, right? And, and again, you know, these are the crushers that are one step below, you know, the 100, 200 guys, which I never stepped into, but, mm -hmm. and then that's, that's even more political. These 2550 guys might even be stronger because these are just, get up and go yeah the, the 100 um, 200 is yeah. like you need an invite you right. need to be like this rich right. billionaire whale right. and all exactly. of this kind of thing exactly. yeah mm -hmm. right 2550 doesn't have that drama so i'll give you one funny story one time i was playing 510 and matasau came in to play 2550 plo and immediately six sharks just came down on the table I think I think I would fly there. I would just book a flight, yeah. you know. So so it's like they just came out of like they were like standing behind the machines. Like instantly, he was broken three hours. As soon as he turned the corner, they stopped playing and left. Yeah. Like I saw that regularly. Okay. So I mean that to me, I don't understand that. Like I don't know how these guys are making money that way, but they obviously are. They've got some other. They've got whatever. These guys are amazing. So it was really fun to play with these guys. I enjoyed it. I had some good. And I had some good 10-20 games that I was uh, winning at. So 10-20 is not 25-50. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, they're not even close. It's also crazy. So I did play in some good 10, 20 games, and I would leave. Now those games also got filled, but th in those games, you in a 10, 20 game, if you get there right away, you can do it. You can make it in some. Sometimes you can scout hard. You cannot scout 2550. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist in Vegas, right? So what I'm trying to say to your viewers is, um, no matter your skill level, okay, you can scout aggressively. Um, and it will massively improve your win rate. Okay, it's don't be afraid to change tables. Don't be afraid to change seats. Uh, if if you if you know if your bottom line is EV, seriously, it's a very important strategy. In the beginning, I was switching. So so at at, at Red Rock, I couldn't switch. As soon as I got to Aria and Win and all this, I was switching left and right. Um, and then eventually, I stopped switching. Uh, I just, you know, I. I I had different goals. I'll explain that later. Okay. Um, but for 510, very heavy table selection, and it paid off, and my, and my bankroll became real. And it was it was very, very nice. I think there's so, an online yeah. comparison as well. Like, people get so used to playing in the age of Zoom, where you sometimes you jump into the pool when it's a little bit softer, but by and large, there's not a whole lot of table selection going on. And they right. forget, like, some tough, you know, strong players I've taught who are beating you know difficult zoom games like 100 nl zoom which is not like an easy game by the standards right. of what it used to be are maybe just playing that for eight hours a day when for three of those hours there was like some whale infested regular tables running but they just forgot to check so i think like the table right. selection point is, is a brilliant one like you have to be right. alert because you've honed all of these tools you've you've honed all of these weapons through all your hard work why do you want to fight tougher bosses for the same amount of money when you don't have to? Like, that's not right. going to, like, your tools aren't going to suddenly become bad because you play in a few soft games. You don't have to play against the toughest competition available. You want to make the most money. And, yeah, that's going to make your life better. That's going to make your circle of reinforcement better. And it's going to make your sense of self-worth better. And it's going to inspire you more to go out and work harder and do better. So yes. yeah, the more did you and find it's gonna the... keep you humble? It'll keep you right. humble. You know, if you think you're the you're the number one. I look. I ended up becoming the number one, and I know it sounds arrogant, but I'm really proud of myself. I became the number one two five player. It sounds bad, but I I mean, it sounds arrogant, but it's just true. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so proud of myself uh, for doing it, for putting in the work. And I remember like, so I'm not I'm not gonna name names, but there's you know I I've played with all the two five vloggers, the famous vloggers, mm -hmm. and um, I was just running over these guys. Okay, and it was just so good. And then I'd go and see their analysis and see how garbage it was, and <laughs> and and I, you know, and so like they just these guys didn't put in the pile work. Yeah, they, they, it's, it's almost they like they've chance. they've tried to survive with no GTO in right. the age of GTO, and it's right. kind of like you can't do that. Like you can't just sit down today. And I've seen some of these vlogs again, not naming names, but I've seen vlogs right. where people are like, "Oh, we were on the flop. We could bet for value," and every hand is just like visualized in a vacuum. The the range you know right. the, right. the ideas of which tools go with which parts of your range are just non-existent because i think what gto has taught us is that the toolkit of poker is much wider and more vast like the toolkit of all the different lines and actions that one can take is much more vast than was originally thought but these people yes. who are vlogging and commenting and missing out on any gto principles are working with like 2011 tools it's like trying to make swords out of stone and fight world war ii or something it really is like it, that obsolete it is, it is it is they got no chance but let me to give them their credit here's their biggest mistake this is their biggest mistake um you know what i'll give them the benefit of the doubt let's say these guys are exploitative geniuses or whatever and they can crush the fish but can you whatever. be can you be an exploitative so, uh, genius with not. that lack you can't mm. be you cannot be but let's just pretend that they are whatever okay. they did not switch gears against me Mm -hmm. So they left themselves open, right? I exploited them, or, you know, naturally with GTO, but they were leaving themselves open to exploitation by not adjusting to me because they didn't know how to adjust, mm -hmm. right? They just played their same game and they, and they, it's, you know, so I know how they play and I know how to exploit their strategy. So I can even deviate from GVO. That's when I really knew I was becoming strong was when I could deviate away from GTO a little bit against the regs to take advantage of them, right, of the other winners. Mm -hmm. That's when I knew I was ready to make that jump to 510. So what right? would you say are, like, there'll be a lot of viewers listening to this and I guarantee you they'll be thinking, okay, this guy is clearly done very well. He's very happy about it. He's very proud of himself. But how does that help me? Like, I don't just want to hear how this guy is crushed and become an right. end boss. I want to hear right. what the biggest right. 
right. exploits are that someone right. watching this right. could take to a two five game after right. after COVID when everything opens back up again right. and there'll be an influx of bad players and it'll be a great time to, to go and do it. So what are three or four things or two or three things maybe general things that regs the best regs at two five are getting smashed at because they don't understand properly how you exploit them got you okay well first i want to say is that the you know i'm a very fortunate person i was able to to spend that time many people have wives kids jobs but well you have a wife as well right no, no. Pile no, silver. No, no. Oh, true. true. Yes, yeah, you scared me, man. Jeez. Um, no. So, ah, oh, well. Anyway, uh, yeah. So we'll get to, we'll get to all the all the personal stuff later. But um, so that's a great question. So first of all, I'll say is there's no shortcut. So you're not gonna be a winner at the game. You're not gonna be able to beat the rake without putting in pile work today. I don't think you can beat the rake today without pile work because you're gonna run into people. Even one person like me can really kill your win rate. Right, especially if they're on your left, and I'm going to get on your left. So you really got to be careful. Um, but here's what I would say. First of all, the biggest thing I noticed with these regs making pre-flop mistakes, bad ones, like three betting and four betting mistakes. They weren't balanced, so it was insane. Uh, you know, uh, and again, my, so again, my main focus was post-flop, of course, and I had my, you know, pretty much GTO. But you know, they weren't balanced pre-flop. You know, some of them were bluffing way too much. Like two hundred four bet bluffing too much. Or? Like four bet bluffing, five bet jamming too much. And remember, I always bought in two hundred bigs deep at two five, and so did they. We're always buying in for one k, right? And it just seems like they didn't study two hundred big blind deep pre flop, well, which I did. I'd run Munker mm. many times, you know, on all different sorts of sizes and such. So I had pre flop locked. That's step one. So here's step one to your step. I'm telling you, the most important thing is solving preflop for the rake for the game you're playing yeah. and just stick to that don't even change that and that's, that's why we're running a seminar one. if i may plug just very quickly here opportunistically yeah, ahead, we're running a seminar on the 15th of may on how to adapt preflop we're going to look at preflop equilibrium we're going to look at the rake we're going to see how the rake affects different games we're going to do hypothetical studies on rake that's higher than anywhere that's run no rake games and see how that would affect hand selection three bet selection four bet selection so feel free to join us on the 15th of May. You can go onto my website, carrotcorner.com forward slash seminars or navigate to the seminars tab on the website and you can sign up for that. We're hoping there'll be a, a nice little turnout and we can get some discussion and Q's and A's afterwards. But back to your point too, if you're about the preflop exploits, um, why do you, well, I guess I know why that happens. Like the, the phenomenon of people being, of over bluffing is basically based on not having range construction and not having an understanding Correct. of the bigger picture because they're That's basically ridiculous. sitting there they're going, oh, this annoying guy on my left has three bet me again. I have a king in my hand. Fuck it, let's four bet this this dickhead. And they're four betting you because they have a king in their hand. How many combos in their opening range have a king in their hand, right? And then they just See? become correct. Yeah, correct. So, so again, I'm watching these regs tank preflop. Okay, and that's insane. That was insane to me at the time. You know, they were getting stuck preflop in very simple spots. So I knew that these guys were weak right off the bat. Um, so that was step one. Uh, I just want to say a, a side story. When I first moved to Vegas, I played with a, a guy who I really respect. He was a, he was a great gambler, nice guy. Um, and he's a, a 2-5 end boss of sorts. And he quit me. He said, I'm not playing you anymore. That was the proudest moment of my poker career. Yeah. The guy I looked up to, and he took 1,000 off of me in Chinese poker when I was a fish, uh, and, and I always wanted the revenge, and I got my revenge, and he says, I'm done with you. That's that good. was the greatest moment of my life. But anyway, um, so that's step one. Step two, I would say not an, not having an understanding of, of how the runouts affect the board, especially the turn. Right, I mm -hmm. could see, you know, river people are low, but the turn you really got to understand because remember, the turn is more difficult because you still have the river unknown. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time how the the, the 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 dynamicism of turn cards on all types of boards, right, and how that affects your strategy, how that affects sizing, how that affects range construction, everything. So one thing that changed in my game very quickly was you're thinking about the runouts immediately. You're not making a move on the flop unless it's, you know, like a hundred percent C bet or something like that, but you're not making a move on the flop without considering all the runouts, all of them you must. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, of course it becomes instinctual with Pio and Pio has that built in, 
but these guys are not doing pile work. It's it's obvious to me they're playing the flop. Yeah, they're betting much. big on a monotone flop because right now there is no fourth club. But they don't realize so, that so yeah. much of the time there will be, and they don't want this pot to be this that's size a and stuff like example. that. Yep. That's that's one of many examples. But even that I can forgive. It's just the problem is, is they then they get caught on a turn with no plan, and they're not sure. Then they're rethinking on the turn. Like I know by the time I make a move on the flop, I know exactly what I'm doing on the turn on every single card that's coming. Right. Yeah, that's just because a function of pile work. That's just looking that's at pile for pile. hours and I, hours. You can't make a flop play without knowing that. So that so so what really changed with me, what was very quick to change and what's thrived, it was the, the value game of poker is not too complicated. It's the bluffing game, mm -hmm. right? Making sure you're not over bluffing and you're not under bluffing and you're picking the right combos to do it with. And it's the sizing okay. as well. It's like which combos go into which size and, and size where do we have small sizes? And Absolutely. And yeah. why? So that was huge as well. So And I became fearless because I knew when to bluff, right? So when I was the first year of playing, I did not bluff nearly enough because mm -hmm. I was afraid. Common right? mistake for anyone of that right. level, yeah. Yeah, very common mistake. I was mostly afraid because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But when I, now that I just did so much reinforcement, like, you know, when he just... When you, if you, if you, if you're, if you have a, a backdoor, just as a crude example, mm -hmm. you know, you have a backdoor flush draw with no showdown, and you improve to a. Now this is obvious. You improve to a fr flush uh, draw on the turn. You're gonna bet a lot of the time, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. Which combos are you gonna bet? Which combos are you gonna check and maybe save for the river? All these things, right? And, and so I guess, I guess part of what I'm trying to. So this is a, a third advice for your, for your, for your um, viewers, and I would even stop here because this is so much. Uh, so you got the pre-flop. You've got the runouts, and then this is sort of tied into the runouts. You need to have bluffs in every line and the right amount, the right ratio, and the right combos, right? You need to always be thinking, you know, I need to have, you need to always have your range constructed, and you need to have bluffs in every line. And the right ratio might change as well, right? Depending on the player. Like against a lot of these weak 2 5 regs Correct. who are not used yes, to being bluff months, the right ratio could right. be always yes. bluffing whenever you don't absolutely. have any pot share or when, whenever the pot yes. share of yes. bluffing is better than the pot share of yes. checking we might just yes. do it because yes. they're not adjusting well right yes. so that's the key but that comes later mm -hmm. okay that's certainly so that was the second thing i discovered mm -hmm. was was weak players i can bluff pretty much any two they're yeah. not meeting minimum defense ah so i spent a crap ton of time working on minimum defense frequencies nice. it was critical right I, I i truly believe that that's what took my game to the next level because i cannot be caught off guard i you know and a lot of players like so when i went to ari and win i was meeting a crap ton of tourists i do not believe this is my my truth at least not yet maybe i'm not strong enough i do not believe in population reads save omcs like really old mcs mm -hmm. maybe that's the, but outside of that i've seen too much randomness so i'm telling you there's just a random factor in the tourist absolutely someone is so bad there's no tendencies it's pure random so minimum defense is my savior mm -hmm. right minimum defense allowed me to crush right that's yeah. it's that simple so but you can say general defense, things right you could say something like tourists are on average far more merged in spots where they should be polar and simple truths like these like these will hold as long as we don't go into too much detail about the assumption like you're barely going to get a tourist this could happen but you're rarely going to get a tourist that is too polarized in a spot i would say you know i'd have to disagree there yeah i've had tourists that were so random that they just happen to be insanely polarized and i know it, and it was more common than i realized yeah it's, it's gonna happen I, let know? me rephrase then maybe what i'm saying is if we make population, the reason I disagree with you is I think that if we make population reads that are right 74% of the time and we act on them rather than falling back onto GTO, we will make more money. So they don't have to be right a really high amount of the time as long as they're right, right a little bit more than 50%. Right. So I could not find those. Right. I did not find those po those high confidence population reads. And that could be because of my weakness. And remember, I'm not an exploitative guy, so it could right. just be that. But I did not, f I looked for them and I did not find them. Mm -hmm. I did find them with some OMCs mm -hmm. and with players I had history. So yes, so when I got history, mm -hmm. And, and and decent history. I needed some history. I, yeah, I, let me rephrase. Actually, I, I, let me rephrase that. I'm not really. I, uh, I needed a little bit of history. Yeah. Right. I needed a little. Sometimes there's some history, quick history that you can make assumptions. But I would never blind. I, this is true. Never would I blind. Even if it's an old guy, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I would never blindly exploit right on a population read now it could be i'm wrong easily i don't have the experience like that and i didn't focus but i mean it's not experience. it's probably not necessary to crush the games i think 
it's a very difficult thing to get right because you don't want to overshoot the mark and start being overly right, assumptive right, and you right, also right. probably don't want to be too vague with your reads either um so right, right. You need, i guess like the way i approach it is i try to find the sort of read that will apply to most people so like in online poker right you know when somebody like min donks the flop i think it's perfectly fine to say like when they bet like two big blinds in the flop i think it's perfectly yeah. fine to say there's plenty of air in this range on average some people have no air at all some people have o- are right, only doing this right, when they hit the right. board but if we took a thousand people there would be a fair amount of air in there so like the other day i just i was explaining to a student during a session why i wanted to raise with queen seven with the queen of spades on i think i'd opened button this fish had called big blind and flop was something like i don't even know like jack five four um with two spades or something like that and he just like min donks and i was like you can raise this hand because it's pot share by calling is quite low therefore you know when you raise because there is enough air in like low pairs and there'll be enough barrel opportunity so i guess what i'm saying is i don't know that player but i know against pool that their range is sufficiently merged capped air heavy that i can raise flop and barrel lots that's of turns and that'll that, be better so fair. nothing too that's specific fair. basically just like right, very right, broad right, tendencies right, right that's very fair um so let me kind of compromise with you i became very good at very quickly understanding the player type mm-hmm. i could you know i could spot like all i needed was uh, is sometimes even just you know two hands like i got became very good at quick you know i wouldn't do anything unknown but but i became very fast at, at understanding mm-hmm. so I, the exploits came in very quickly. I, I didn't develop, you know, so again, like with the, that, that, that donk lead, for example, you know, that's also GTO. You know, GTO, that donk lead's going to have, gonna have uh, just, uh, you know, it's going to basically be like ignorable, right? So, yeah. but, but, and, you and it's going to be semi polar as well. It's going to be quite polarized and low frequency and small and, yeah, ignorable. Right. You're right, though. You're right that they're, they're deaf. I could see in that spot and spots like those, I agree with you. There are definitely population tendencies. I just don't know them. Mm-hmm. I didn't experience too much of that live. Right. Okay. I didn't experience too much. I well, so I obviously had to study donks, mm-hmm. right? I did. I studied a lot of donks leading and limping i studied a lot about playing against limpers mm-hmm. um, which is not too complicated but i need it was important as it was showing up so but yes i think you're right you are right i just um yeah i just um i, I think i did that sort of subconsciously maybe without even really yeah on probably it. Case, like i, I doubt know? that when you see like some some random tourist take a line that you're actually imagining right, like the exact right. pio range that no, the no, software of would use. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I think I think I'm just I you know, I'm still stuck on my GTO philosophy at the end. I'm really am still psychologically stuck. It, ser- on that. it serves you well and it's a good place it to did. start That's though. Right, I can right, I can understand. Right. But, okay. but, I gotta, but you're right. Okay. So let's then. let's move on then to the present. So that's where you got to where you are now. What are your obviously just now we're in lockdown so maybe we'll go to the present right. before we go to the future are you right. Right. playing online or what are you doing to sort of right. keep your right. fire of poker ignited during right. these times right i will tell you so first of all um also while i was doing this live play some days i was taking off and playing online and i play on wsop.com which is all single tables and i you know took impeccable notes on the skill level so i, I became a massive online table selector a bomb hunter supreme right and the 200 nl is extremely beatable the 500 nl is very difficult on mm-hmm. wsp.com there's a nine day difference so the five the 500 i would only play on a rare occasion when there were like two donkeys yeah. spewers um, but so that also helped me even more with the table select so i i don't see how like if you can play online and table select and you don't you are pissing away half of your winnings in my eyes it's just ridiculous not to do that aggressively but anyway so how do i keep so i'll tell you a lot of so now we can move into the psychology of the situation so you know um poker has changed my brain um it is basically a form of cognitive behavioral therapy for me so can i get a little personal here is that okay of course absolutely we were not shy on this podcast at all so i i have bipolar disorder type one which is a very brutal uh, illness that uh, is just tough to manage but poker got me to slow down and organize my thoughts. What first step first, second step second. I know you remember me last year. I was all over the place, right? But I mean, just, I think you're all you've always been a, a bit of an eccentric guy. I, would, I do think right. that you sound more focused, calmer. Like I don't know, just like the machinery is running in an, in a smooth kind of rhythmic way now let more than it was that's the feeling yes. i get if i may like give you my honest that is, insight that is yep. exactly what it is and that's one reason only because of that year of meditation with pio wow okay it's when you it's, say meditation with pio do you mean 
doing meditation and then doing pile work or do you no, mean pile was sure. your meditation no, pile was now i do do meditation as well mm -hmm. and that's also been a huge help in my cognition mm -hmm. but no pile itself was meditation right because because you know it's you it's you and pio your thoughts you're not thinking about anything else my thoughts never wandered ever that's the mm -hmm. beauty of pio i was so focused on it because i wanted to learn the secrets of poker and pio was showing me those beautiful and like it was like when you find a secret in Pio, when you find like, wait, why the hell is Pio betting this combo and not this one? And it drives you nuts. Sometimes I'd spend five, six hours and then you figure it out and it's like solving a puzzle. Eureka. You know? And that feeling, that Eureka feeling was it my drug. I was chasing that Eureka. Can I ask um, you a personal then, question then? Yeah, absolutely. Are there advantages to your condition, to your bipolar condition? Like are there things that it enables you to do that you think that people that are not diagnosed with anything like that would not be able to as readily do when it comes to poker? Um, yes, in the following way. Now, I truly believe that anybody, anybody can become a crusher at poker if they put in the work, the proper work, okay? But the advantage my illness gave me is when I am, is it causes me to severely hyper-focus, right? Um, I can just... And, and that's not a good thing normally mm -hmm. and because it leads to burnout and crushing and I always crash. So mm -hmm. bipolar is always a cycle up and down. Uh, but when, when the manic is in, the energy is endless and I then the creativity is flowing mm -hmm. and Pio is creative, right? I real so I realized, so I've always needed a creative outlet and I didn't have one because I, I so my, my calling in life is to be a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. I, I did writing in the past, but my brain was just not organized. I couldn't do it, mm -hmm. okay? After this pile work, I'm writing again, and it's great stuff, and I and I believe I can do it. What, right? what are you so, writing, fiction or? Um, I'm writing a lot of poetry, but my plan nice. is to write fiction. I'm just writing poetry for now, mm -hmm. but um, I love poetry and writing it. But but my, my So poker gave me the confidence. It gave me the structure. And my illness, by the way, poker taught me how to take care of my illness, right? So my illness was terrible. It was killing me for since I was about 12. Mm -hmm. I got diagnosed with depression at 12 and bipolar at 18. Mm -hmm. It was killing me. I did a lot of drugs, a lot of drug abuse. But after Pio, um, I realized, listen, man, you're not taking care of your illness. No wonder it's killing you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing drugs. You're, you're eating like shit. You're not exercising. You're taking crap. You know, you're not seeing your doctors. I mean, it became like, you know, like fold seven deuce off suit. Just I can't explain it. Like, I like this, that. this was from poker. Yeah. This was so just to poker. clarify what you mean there, you're basically saying you were living the sort of lifestyle where you were opening the pot with seven deuce off and then wondering why you were getting smashed. Yeah, That's kind of exactly. what you're saying. Right. Exactly. I'm like, why is this illness killing me this? Because I was, I was triggering it nonstop. I was doing mm -hmm. everything you shouldn't do, mm -hmm. right? I was doing the worst thing for me. And poker kind of just, I'll tell you this way. It's like, Poker just took me out of my own head for a little bit. Pio, you know, I moved my head into Pio, mm -hmm. and Pio is much smarter than I am, okay? So I learned from Pio, and that structure, that that thought, that learning process, okay, listen, and, and also the humbleness, realizing that I sucked at poker when I thought I was good, mm -hmm. that also, maybe I suck at managing my illness, maybe I suck with women, maybe I wasn't the best boyfriend in the past, so I started to question everything, and when you recognize the problem, that's half the battle, okay, so poker gave me the confidence, and it, and it made me respect myself, you know, I had very low self-respect and self-esteem mm -hmm. most of my life, um, but, you know, for whatever reason, but I just, I couldn't deny that I was gifted at poker. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just slaughtering um, and I'm new to the game. You know, I'm a games player. I dedicated my life to games and I, I, that's what I want to do and I don't regret that in the slightest. You know, that's my life, games are my life. But I feel like now I can actually do anything, right? So I'm going back to writing and I'm gonna give writing a shot. I may succeed, I may not. You know, I've always got poker. Poker's not going anywhere, and I'm always going to stay in poker. So right now, I'm big into eight-game mix. I have private games. Love it. I play in eight-game mix private games, and I love – I just – I enjoy eight-game mix for many reasons. One of them is, is because I like when my customers are happy, yeah. okay? Um, I was fortunate. So the Red Rock game, for example, the 2-5, even that was a – we became friends. It was a good game. But at the win in Aria, it's just like – I don't – you know, it's just – whatever 
people bitching and a lot of bitching and a lot of just shitty yeah. environment. Eight game mixed games are much much better environment. Yeah. PLO as well. I did play a lot of PLO, but I, I got into the mix and I'm you know I'm not nearly as strong at the mix as I am in No Limit Cash. But I've been studying so so that was one year. So for, I'd say for the past like. I don't know, four or five months, I've been really hitting the mix, study hard, uh, poker, pro poker tools and trout you later. That's all you need for the mix. Um, I know what to do, right? It's, hmm. it's going much faster this go around. I know exactly what to do. One day you can coach me in stud. I find stud okay, the most okay. difficult stud game in the is world. The most difficult. It's my weakest game. It's I, a it's horrible a game. complicated game. It's got yeah. more variance than PLO. Stud high is my nightmare. And now I'm getting into it. Yeah. I, I tried to push it off as much as possible. Now I have to do it. And I'm telling you, I don't know anything about stud high. Yeah, that's I the one game that when I'm playing eight game, I just feel like it's, these I guys are doing walk. something <laughs> to me. And I don't know what it is. And I don't it's, like it's, it. It's, it's like being abducted by aliens and like probed. It's horrible. It is, man. And I'm telling you, it's funny that you say that because I was literally like having this conversation a week ago like listen man I, I hate to say it but I got to start studying stud high it's mm -hmm. time you know I've done like Raz Raz is so natural to me um, yeah, Raz is like a formula it's kind of like I know a formula you exactly mm -hmm. it's just a straight formula stud is so complicated um, everything uh, but what, one thing I love about stud games is I love board reading love it it's a mm -hmm. whole new game it's a different game stud can keep you busy for life stud highs any of the stud games even mm -hmm. raz raz I, raz is a formula but stud stud eight or better is beautiful so i did you know a lot of oe at the world series cash when i was dipping my toe in mix um you know so but eight game so i plan on being an eight game mix specialist what's your favorite game in eight game Deuce to seven, no question. I love this. And, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty strong at Deuce to seven. I spent a lot of time. That was the first game I went on, went on attack, and um, I love Deuce to seven. And there's so the that's the biggest edge game in eight game mix. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and the and do you like exploitative play? You need to be playing Deuce to seven. Oh yeah, yeah. When oh, I play so eight I game online, play. I feel like I get probably crushed at stud, and then oh my oh wait, and oh my right. PLO, I'm right. probably not. I don't have an edge at at all when I'm playing like 2-4 right. online. Holdem, I obviously have a big edge at limit. Holdem, right. I have an edge at. And Deuce to yes. 7, for some reason, I just feel like I'm better than the 8 game regs at yes. Deuce to 7. I don't yes. know why, because I've never played it much, but I just right. feel like I understand that it. it clicks right. with me really naturally for whatever reason. I'm not I sure. think it's because, I, this is my honest opinion, Deuce to 7 has a lot of instinctual plays there, mm -hmm. okay? It's a lot of instinct. You just know. Like, I've made some incredible folds in Deuce to 7 that you, you, you'd you never make GTO, but you just know, mm -hmm. right? I've, I've played with, with some... So I, I so I, even when I was grinding, I would still play. There was a four eight mix game. I would play, you know, just just for fun, mm -hmm. maybe an hour or two to warm up or whatever. And I played with these two ladies, and they never ever ever bluffed once over this you know two year period of me fiddling with the mix. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, so when and then when that comes to deuce to seven, and when you see the draws, when you see the information, there's no guessing. Game. They're not remembering the cards they threw away. You know, they're not they're not thinking about these things. So you just know. Right. So it's funny. It's it's kind of funny. And I kind of have to be careful. Right. Because I just am going to when they check raise me, for example, I'm going to instantly muck any hand I have. That's not like no, it's really smooth. Better, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, so so but I don't want to make it so obvious. So I say, mm, I'm not sure, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I and that's not to be like. A, that's to be because I believe that when you're good at the game, you have to be responsible for the atmosphere. Like that's my style because I grew up in backgammon where it's all private games. So I always want my customers, even though they're losing, to be as happy as possible. I don't want to just take people's money and make them feel bad. I know I'm sounding like a hero, but it's just the way I was trained because I had to be invited back in backgammon or I was gone. Mm -hmm. So that's just in me. Uh, but now I'm into private poker games, these eight game mixes. And if they like you, they invite you to more games and you mm -hmm. get more opening so i'm moving into the private game world and i like it and it's actually harder ironically i thought it would be softer mm -hmm. it's not but it's still good it's still plenty good um there's still plenty of softness but i thought it would actually be a breeze but i was uh, surprised that no these guys are no fools but it's better i enjoy the private games more um and there's still plenty profitable um so eight game mix is my focus probably for life but mm -hmm. i will always be playing no limit cash and if i need if i want to you know so I, you know, if I want to, let's say I want to start firing 10Ks. I did play the 10K eight game last year, 
in Poker Masters. It was wonderful. I, I ran deep. And then Mike Gordinsky just uh, slaughtered me in 08, limit, limit 08, which is a very tough game. Sure. And uh, he's a, he, this guy is a god. So he humbled the sh- I'm telling you, he's probably the best mixed games player in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, just I was w- with watching him the entire time. I was just blown away by his moves and solidity and everything. But long story short, um, I love eight game mix. That's my passion. My passion, because I want, I think it's good for the poker world too. I think it's a good for the poker world. It's a lot of fun. Deuce to seven's a lot of fun. And I'm a big believer in giving the fish back some of that edge. We've taken too much. We've taken too much away. We're going to kill the game. So I'm a big supporter of PLO. Even though the edge in PLO is massive, at least the fish get massive heaters. And I yeah. love that. I yeah. love seeing fish destroy the pros and having the pros. So, oh, let me just go into PLO real quick for your viewers about the live PLO scene. I did play a lot of live PLO as well. Um, the one two five game at the win is good, but you got to be careful. There's some solid ass players and same with the Aria. So PLO is not as juicy as I thought it was going to be. Okay. There's some good talent there, even at the one, two, five and the two, five game, the two, five, 10, you need, you need a hundred K bankroll for that baby minimum. Okay. It plays huge straddles. You really need more than 100 K. Yeah. It's a tough game. You've got, you've got Jason Stockfish there. Who's just a crusher. Who's there all the time. You've got like two other crushers there. So PLO, I thought like, okay, well let's go into PLO now. Cause I heard it's juicier. My experience is the money is in no limit cash, no limit hold'em cash. I mean, that's the game the fish want to play. I mean, that's the game they've that's heard the about. Game. They've seen it on, on TV, on the internet. That's the it's one they're going to play the, the most. Yeah. It's still the most profitable game and live poker. If you, if you're listening to me and you are serious about making a living in poker, um, the best way to do it, if you can do it, is live poker. Mm-hmm. If you move to Vegas, you'll make more money than online. Uh, you will. Online is just harder um, and tougher. I mean, I, I don't know if that's true, but there is so much money to be made live. It's, if it's only you could play the, the same amount of hands, right, or anything close to it, you could right. like absolutely so you dominate. Mistakes, right? you have I have, mistakes, right? I have dreams of being on like a swivelly office chair in the middle of like four Zoom tables and hologram people are being sat in right. front of me right. every time and I'm just like playing a yes. thousand hands an hour yes. live, like yes. 50 that's BB to 100. <laughs> right, that's the dream. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the big change. However, um, you're focused on, you. so, why I preferred live. So I, I cannot do more than three tables online. I cannot. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to, and, and I don't think I ever can. It's just not for me. When I'm playing live, when I'm playing live, I'm not watching my iPad. I'm not listening to music. I'm focused on every single hand, every action all the time, mm-hmm. because I want every bit of information I can get. Okay. I'm so focused and I am the end. I don't move. I don't talk. I look at every single action. To, to glean all the information that increases my win rate period so um i love the one table aspect i don't like the slowness obviously the slowness yeah. kills but i it's okay with me because i you know and, and i did so what are you doing you can i ask you a question then yeah. so what are you doing mentally like you've described that ah. obviously you have this condition and you're very very energized sometimes and imagine when you're playing poker you're generally very energized because that's like your passion that's what you're putting right. your your energy into so how are you coping with the monotony of being dealt eight four off 40 times in a row right right excellent question well uh it's a multifaceted answer um first of all um when i get too manic i step away Mm -hmm. right i can play on a decent level of mania and play my game and by the way i only play my a game okay i don't Mm -hmm. go but i've been lucky and it could be that this will change over time but I don't know what happened. This I don't know. It could just be that I studied so much with Pio. And like, so I have not gotten tilted since we've talked mm-hmm. once. I do not get tilted because I'm confident in my game. I don't take it personal, right? I don't, I do not get tilted. I don't care how bad I run. It does not, I have, and I smile and that's the best quality about me. I love that about myself. I think a lot of people would be very envious of that, the ability uh, to I'm be enjoying a losing I'm day. Envious. I love, I did not mind losing at all. It didn't depress me. I, it didn't discourage me. I understand poker. That's poker, folks. It just didn't get to me. And that's another sign that I knew I was going to make it big. So, okay? what, so what are you doing then during these these card okay. dead this phases? This is very tough. This has very, been very tough. So I, uh, two months ago, this whole thing triggered a massive manic episode. It was bad. And normally I don't get this bad, but it's understandable. This is a, everything's shaken up for me. 
right? It hurts me not to go to the casino. It really, I didn't realize how painful it would get. I really, really want to go play because that's where my friends are at the end mm-hmm. of the day. That's where the social scene is. I know the poker room staff. You know, I'm close with the, with all the guys in Vegas on the ground. I help them set tournaments. I, you know, I, I, I don't know if it was all me, but I encouraged that eight game at Poker Masters, and I think they listened to me, and I showed up there. I'm not a 10K crusher, although you're not going to believe me, but, well, I'll tell you straight up, those Poker Masters are juicy, okay? Um, anyway, um, they're, they're good stuff, okay? But, but So I actually, I believe I had an edge at that eight game, very small. I could be wrong, though. That's just a guess, but I, I had a very juicy table to start, okay? And then Mike Gordo came in, and then maybe I wasn't at an edge anymore, but... But uh, Gordo is a god. Sorry for going off. On right. Gordo. So, I th- so yeah. I think like, can can I take you back to the original yeah, question? Because I didn't take I didn't get a satisfactory answer to it. Yeah, although that's all back. very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, what sorry. I want to understand is that like I'm picturing you in the casino with what I know about your personality, with the way you are as a character, and like how quickly your mind goes and stuff like that. And I'm trying to picture you folding a hand every two minutes for yeah. six hours one day didn't because you're not getting any cards. So what are you didn't doing? So what's filling? your sort of lens of consciousness watching at that game. point just watching and seeing watching how people are playing and and thinking about all the plays i'm playing every right. hand myself because mm-hmm. i want to get better at the end of the day interesting I, i'm there to get the experience i, I wasn't even there to make money mm-hmm. i was there to become a better poker player you have to put in the hours at some point i felt but i was already hitting the ground running so it's an but absolute fascination to... then you're just absolutely so curious well, it was that a fascination and it was also a desire to get stronger that was more than anything it was the desire to get stronger was what kept me focused that's what i wanted to do i wanted to be a poker crusher it was my goal for a long time I, you know i'm a professional gambler i have been for a while i worked in finance before that i've just been gambling my whole life and i wanted to succeed in poker and i enjoyed it like i just enjoyed it you know it's a it's a good game it's relaxing it became meditation so Pio was my meditation the live was even more meditation mm-hmm. because i'm sitting there with my hands in my lap like bonomo you know mm-hmm. not saying a word and watching and not thinking my thoughts aren't racing i'm just thinking the table I'm thinking poker. That is what meditation is, right? You're in the moment, yeah. So losing didn't affect me. I would come home from the table ecstatic that I, that just by, I'd feel refreshed, as ironic as that sounds. That was my refresh, that was my medicine. Okay, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you, do you understand and appreciate this is a bit of a personal question that you're the way your mind works is extremely rare like you're very much an anomaly and it i think it actually really helps you in poker i think it gives you yes. the sort of mentality that a lot of players out there would absolutely dream to have so i'm not sure that it helps anyone that whose mind isn't wired that way to hear how to you it's just natural and enjoyable to lose right so for most people when they lose they become like disheartened they become dissatisfied they lose interest it's a vicious cycle right like one thing leads to another and it's very yeah, circular i was in that my first so, year i was in that i tilted hard my first year right okay so that's interesting so it's so you've not yeah. always been that way it was more no, just no, as the confidence no. grew it was the confidence that's it. right it so to me this is like was. Was bashing piled. down a door like or a window is maybe a better analogy like you can see where you want to get to but you but a lot of people are lacking the fundamental skills to be that confident that variance doesn't upset them and then because variance yeah. upsets them they yes. then feel as if they get disheartened then they stop improving and i feel like they people get stunted and trapped in this horrible circular thing where if they could only not care about losing they could get better so that they could not care about losing right but they can't they're like stuck in this like circle so what was or what would your advice be to someone who's feeling that way? How do they break out of it? Is it just sheer study and marrying Pio sheer and going study. home to it every well, night? No. Or... So it's a double fat. So one is sheer study. That's mm-hmm. most important. Two is perspective. You know, okay. I, I'll just tell you the blunt truth. Like, you know, I've, I've been to Africa. I've seen an old woman's head get bashed in over a bag of rice. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not going to sit here and whine about a poker hand after seeing this stuff and realizing what's I just it became ridiculous. It but talk to us about so when you did tilt. Talk to us about when that uh, first year. Well, why were you tilting? I was young and immature because I was because I was not used to not getting my way. Right. And it took practice. I had to practice not getting my way. I was spoiled rotten my whole life, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I wasn't used to getting my way, and I had a big ego. Mm-hmm. Right. My ego is probably bigger now, but less in other ways. You mm-hmm. know. 
Um, I just didn't take, I was taking it also, then I told you this on other podcasts, and this is even more true. I was bullied mercilessly as a child, beaten up and bullied nonstop. Mm -hmm. And I was getting triggered trauma, you know, flashbacks on the poker table. That's so common. I, I get that a lot with students. They yeah. say like, this guy's picky on me. This guy thinks he can run over me. And that, that fear of being run over or bullied it is typically, not always, but it's typically, you know, students like people like yourself who had a bit of trauma in childhood on that front, or maybe their, their dad was abusive or one yes. of their parents just sort of like put them down and made them feel like ruined their self-esteem for all of their childhood yes. and those yes. people are very susceptible to that so yep. more susceptible than mo than pretty much anyone else so was and the only means... yeah so was the only thing then that made you not feel that like did you do some kind of inner therapy so that you you disarmed the mental programs that related that to school or so, did you just become yeah. better at poker and that dealt with it so the Becoming better at poker was the main thing. Honestly, it was just pra I got lucky on this one. I probably should have gone into therapy, like mm -hmm. would have helped. It was just practice, experience, and constant mental reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Catching myself, I started to catch myself quickly. That's key. Like, yeah. That was the key. I was able to recognize when I was getting triggered, and also, and I'll tell you this the truth. I'll tell you, there, there's a lot of insecurity, right? When some donkey would start ripping on me at the table, even though I knew I was better than them, I mm -hmm. wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. When I saw how terrible they were, it was became funny. Like, you know, when someone tells me about my play, which is, of course, correct, and their play is garbage, I, I, it, I don't have a need to tell them there. I don't care because I'm getting their money at the end of the day. I was winning left and right. I was the money was flowing more so than even when I was on a heater in my earlier days. You know, um, it was just coming in. Uh, so I, I just and I learned and also this is also part of my healing and everything. It's up to me, and I'm getting older too. You know, I'm 33 now, so I'm older, and, and with age comes, you know, more wisdom, I guess. But it's up to me to not let things in that I don't want in, period. I can't control other people. Um, and I learned to thicken my – poker helped me develop a thicker skin, which is yeah, another sure. great thing of poker, live poker in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I've seen so many crazy shit at the tables. Uh, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff over the, over the last few years, but I became thicker. Um, and it just doesn't get to me anymore. I just, I was just there day in, day out, and and I was stronger. So it just it was a lot of hard work. And Did remember, you have... I was, yeah, I was bad in the beginning. My first year, I tilted like crazy. So uh -huh. it's not like I woke up and I'm some natural genius. It's just hard work. And I was fortunate to have the time to put in that work and the dedication. So during your first year, did you ever have any days when, like everybody, when they first start out, particularly playing live poker, they described this sort of night from hell where they run terribly they're driving home or walking home from the casino at 3 a.m or whenever they go home um and they're just sort of thinking what is my life i've just sat there and lost like yes. five buy-ins and like had my soul destroyed for the last 10 hours what am i doing did you ever go there no i never went there because um i'm very thankful in life right i don't i'm not i don't i i believe my my personal philosophy is there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's, right? If your life is a professional poker player and you're single, but you're a good guy and you put on a smile, you're a winner in mm -hmm. life. Okay, that to me is bad thinking, right? You got to be happy with what you have, right? And life is all about attitude, okay? I do not, I, people who chase, who think this is going to make me happy, that's yeah. going to make me happy, will never be happy, okay? So just to bring this even further, you know, to, 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 to take this home is that, so... A lot of things in my life changed throughout this time. Um, you know, I look back on my relationships. So I'm I'm someone who really enjoys relationships. Um, they're very important to me, and I always, you know, and I I, I prefer to be in a relationship. You mm -hmm. know, but I had to accept being single, right? To to be able to succeed in any relationship. So mm -hmm. I accepted that reality that you know you can't like I said you can't just be chasing things to make you happy. Yeah. But poker gave me that inner strength on a good level. So now I, I'm very comfortable with what I, I know what I want in life in many arenas because I have that thinking from poker. So I know what I want and I know that I'm not going to get it unless I go after it. So now I'm be, and I've also learned. And another thing, this is also tied into poker and the mental game. I think a lot of people tilt because they are caught in a web of lies to themselves and other people. I stopped lying to myself. What were you lying to yourself about? A um, lot of things lot of things um it's hard to be specific i was lying to other people first of all i would lie to people about i would just lie to people to either make myself look better 
um, or to or to keep things even keel, to keep things smooth. And I wouldn't let people know my real self. So if you don't let people know your real self, they can't know you. They can't hurt right? you. So yeah. I, I, that they, well, they can't, they they don't know the real you. So I was you know I just and I also another thing and again this really ties into poker. I was not able to express my wants and needs because I was afraid if I did, then my partner would leave me if I stood up for myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's also tied into the abuse. But poker, again, gave me that confidence. And look, it's again like I know when I need to make a play, and I make that play, right? I make the play in poker. So when I make a bluff and it fails, I'm proud of myself for making the bluff if it's correct. It's a really important point. Yeah. Very, I'm so proud of me. all I care about is making the right move at the right time. That's why I don't get tilted anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, the only time I do get tilted is when I make a mistake in strategy that I should not have done. I don't really get tilted, but I'll get upset, you know, if I if I made a careless mistake. But I, I don't I don't even beat myself up over those anymore. Because because even then, like the human mind only has a limited concentration exactly. span, and no matter exactly. how good you are, right, these things are going to crop up from right from even time like to time. Even, even sauce makes mistakes almost every session, you know. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So that was that. But long story short is that um, poker was one of the best things that ever happened to me on a m on multiple fronts. Okay. I just, mm -hmm. you know, like I've been saying, and and you know, I and honestly, I feel an obligation to poker. I want to give back to poker what it did for me. So I'm trying. You know, I do. I try and stay active in the community. I'm very active in the mixed games community in Vegas. The mixed games community in Vegas is full of really nice people. Uh, a lot of crushers, a lot of good ca – just the, the casuals, the fun players in mix are such good people. Not all of them, obviously, but just – I know I'm friends with them. They're nice. There's like a camaraderie amongst mixed games players out here in Vegas. It's a smaller community. We all know each other. We all see each other. Like if you're going to – like, we, we, you know, the games don't run often. When they do, I know most of the people there. We know each other. That That sense of community – a, a great thing of poker and so i'm gonna so i like to give back i'm very active you know in, in the poker streams on twitter trying to pump a game you know because i think people would like it but also just supporting everybody poker is a beautiful thing and um and uh yeah i mean that's, ba that's sounds like a great note to end on like the yeah. the more motivated you are and the more positives you make sure you don't lose sight of the more positives you keep on your horizons about poker the less likely you are to end up in that jaded rut that you've managed to avoid and it's been and i think that avoidance of that rut has been very responsible for your success in the game so yes. anyways man we better wrap up because we've been over an hour now time flies that was very interesting i loved um catching up with you and just hearing about your your journey and hopefully we can catch up again when the live scene is back you can let me know what's going on and we can we can go from there um sure i hope you enjoyed it uh, i did all my intention was just to be entertaining i hope i was not nearly as wild as last time but that uh, was is a good thing no you were only a, you're only a 9.6 this time on the wild right. scale compared well, to a 9.99994 right yeah but my passion is stronger now i'm telling you yeah it's my more focus you have more focus more passion focus. now for so sure I, i'm yeah. more in love with poker now than i was then that's for good. sure that's good so all right man well thanks for having me on really appreciate it I appreciate that. I'm going to um, quickly plug some stuff. If you want to hang up, feel free to or stay on the line and listen. But I just want to talk about my um, team coaching, which has been very successful so far. In fact, two of you, you probably relate to this, right? Because I coached you and you've, you're have you into coaching, right? You got coached in, in backgammon yes. and in poker. It's critical, by the way. Coaching is mandatory if you want to be good in today's yeah, environment because it's direction setting right like that's the thing they about know, it they know your flaws they've been there it's critical yeah because it's not it's not that you can't learn things on your own like we're not coaching you because we think that you're not intelligent enough or capable enough but the reason we're coaching you is that you need the initial building blocks to see the direction and once you've got the direction you're kind of good to go so what we're doing in the team coaching package the logo if you go to carrotcorner.com forward slash team coaching you'll see these three bricks stacked on top of each other. At the bottom, you've got the the blue and the green one, which symbolizes my coaches, Akshar and Simon. So Akshar is like our exploitative guy that you probably heard on the last episode of the podcast with Simon, who you also heard who's the GTO guy. And basically our belief is a bit different to what you did to you, but we're trying to take the GTO and the exploitative and layer them on top of each other from the start. So when we do a GTO lesson, we do something similar exploitatively that shows people how they can deviate and which directions they can good. deviate from i think from. that's fine i think that's actually the best way if you can do it I think if you can do best. both but you definitely yeah. need the gto like this is the point like the reason that we have someone who's like obsessed with game theory he's just like right. you like you would like him he he basically that sounded like trump there he's like you you would like him you would like him a lot but um yeah 
my girlfriend's been listening to a ton of Trump. She's like in one of these phases where she finds him <laughs> hilarious. So every time I, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm like, that's like a Trump temple way of speaking. Yeah, if you need Dunning Kruger example, you've got the best in the world right there. So. Right. So basically, yeah, like back to the back to the actual relevant fact here. Like I think the reason Simone is like such a good coach for me in this program is that he will actually shut out exploitative things while he's focusing on the on the theory he's very good he's like a horse with blinkers and he's very good at just being like okay what you're saying right now is exploitative we're not talking about that right now we can talk about that later or you can talk about that with akshar or with pete in a different lesson but right now i'm teaching you the fundamentals of this and you will only think about that and i think once you separate those two things here be theory here be practice i don't know if you agree with this but i think you just get you don't get confused or lost anymore because you see where you are on the on the map essentially you are here yeah yeah I, but I, honestly at the end of the day i like your approach i'm coming around to your approach like with that you had with um the grinders manual i like the combination mm -hmm. of gto and exploitatively if i could do it again i would do more node locking that's mm -hmm. the truth mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so i kind of i kind of been on board with your camp at the end of the day yeah and everyone's different everyone learns with a mixture of the two but i think you do need you certainly need gto from the start like if you can learn a bit of game theory from the start it's gonna just straighten you out later like if you start off learning exploitative poker yeah, and then you try and pick up game theory six years down the line because you gotta understand right i'm teaching people privately one-to-one -one who have been playing for 11 years and have never looked at gto before and then right. they're giving me all these reasons for why they're doing things and it's just right. like chaos right. right so the reason right, we've right. got team coaching is we've got a specialist in gto we've got a specialist in exploitative play and my job in the in the package is to meet you on day one and say let me look at your database give it all to me like let me see your whole game like you know stripped down to like all the stats and tendencies and then i'll say well these are the things that are most killing you right now these are the main fundamental building blocks that are missing let's set up gto sessions there and these are the ways that you're not exploiting properly let's set up exploitative sessions there then you meet back up with me in lesson six again i'd set another four blocks another four hours to my other two guys distributed between them and we go from there so that's team coaching you can check out at carrotcorner.com forward slash team coaching we are still taking on students right now so if the form is there and it lets you send us money you are in we'll get you started within the next week that's a guarantee if you sign up for a package we will get you started within a week there'll be no wait list for that so if you're looking for coaching check that out i am currently not taking on private students because i'm too full but that may change in the summer we'll see how things go um but that's all the plugging i want to do and two of you it's been great again talking with you and i wish you all the best for your eight game journey that sounds fantastic and i'd love to get a bit of insight talk to you a little bit about what you've learned about the stud games maybe or something next time sure. you come on the yeah, show yeah so I'll, I'll, i'm gonna study stud high probably for the next couple of months and then then, we, then I'll, I'll fill you in you but can explain I'm to me terrified. why i feel like i'm getting crushed I'm every time i'm I play it. terrified of stud high believe me i it's uh, <laughs> tough well, game. all right we'll, we'll figure it out all right we'll figure it out thanks, thanks for having me on yeah it's been a pleasure best of luck to you as well and enjoy your date tonight i understand you or right. tomorrow i should say right tomorrow night uh, I uh, know it's it's it is Monday and it's it technically it Monday Friday in Vegas in, time. Friday in Vegas. Nine a.m. in the UK here, right. one a.m. for you. So anyway, I hope that goes well. I'm sure it will. All right, all right man. Take care. Take thanks care. Take it easy. And guys, thanks for watching. We'll be back in a week or two with another podcast. Until then, run good and talk to you later.